Welcome, welcome, welcome to this episode of We Date Earth. I have the whole crew in here. We've got Erica, we've got Dan, we have Zen, we've got Connor, we've got me. Uh, well, Sebastian, you can see the name, well, this way, see, see the name here. And we are super excited for this uh, We Date Air episode, which is going to be focused on yesterday's release of we v 118 and you may have already caught a glimpse of the release blog post and read about it in the documentation but i thought the idea of this uh, episode could be can we maybe discuss some of those features and explain them or maybe we could demo some of those features you know just in case if you didn't quite figure out yet how to use them we can maybe show some of those in action so we are super happy to see you here and thank you very much for watching and listening and if you like this content uh, give us a like because that always uh, helps maybe more people like-minded like you and us can come and watch us so this will be super super exciting and the bonus of being here live like always is you can ask questions as we go so um, you can ask questions or, you know, like if you don't have a question, just say hi, say where you're uh, watching us from or, you know, just say, you know, some random fact, you know, just uh, keep it more or less on the topic and we are all going to be fine. So the main topic today, like I mentioned, is we did 118 and we have a bunch of really cool things that we want to talk to you about. So first we'll talk about Cursor API. So Dan will be covering that, and I believe Dan has a, a nice little demo that, that goes over it. Then Connor will be talking to you about Want, and we should probably have a, a whole discussions around it. Erica will be in charge of talking about like the new stuff around BM25 and hybrid, you know, the wear filter and the stop words. Um, Zen will talk about the addition to uh, HNSW, PQ, and then we'll cover like a, an update to replication with tunable consistency and repair on read. We'll go into roaring bitmaps and then finish off with the addition to our backups for Azure. So um, without any further ado, uh, let's start with the cursor API. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Daskalescu. I'm a developer advocate at PV8. And uh, let me introduce you to the Cursor API, which we launched with uh, version 118. The main um, reason for this is that uh, prior to 118, you could only retrieve uh, about 10K objects from a database, which meant you couldn't really use it as a source of truth. But with version 118, we released the Cursor API, which lets you paginate through all objects in the database in a class so you can use with it as your primary database. And the way this works is that uh, we have an after parameter, which is based on UUIDs, and it works for both the REST and the GraphQL APIs. You pass an ID to that parameter, and with it will retrieve objects that follow that ID in insertion order. So that means this API works only for retrieving objects, but not for searching or filters. To demonstrate this, I use um, the WeV8 demo data set Python package, which was also published uh, recently by my colleague JP. And it has uh, a number of uh, data sets, including Jeopardy questions, which I imported into a sandbox. So we have the console here, and I'm going to demonstrate the GraphQL cursor API. So we're getting a Jeopardy question object that starts after the empty string, which means we have to return the first object, object it has. And we also request uh, the ID among the other fields. And uh, this ID will help us resume getting the objects, effectively doing pagination. So you can notice that we have a limit of three objects, and this is the second one. So if I'm going to copy this um, ID and paste it here, then rerun the query, we expect we be able to return objects after this one. So starting with the last object, Danny Thomas Hardy has the answer, and we'll see two more objects from uh, the Jeopardy question class. So let's see if that's what's going to happen. And that indeed happened as predicted. So this is the um, GraphQL usage of the Cursor API. And here we have a um, Jupyter notebook that shows 
how we can use it for the REST API as well. And the code is um, simply a while loop in which we call the objects API with this after parameter. And again, it starts with the MP string. Then we fetch the ID of the last object that was returned and repeat the loop. And there is a setting here in Turbal set 100. So every 100 objects will display some progress. And you can see that um, uh, the client retrieved 100 objects in about 0 0.6 seconds. This is way slower than typical because it's a sandbox. And it eventually finished retrieving all objects. And um, GraphQL functions in a similar way. So we have this uh, query in which we interpolate the after parameter and we pass it via a post request to the uh, V1 GraphQL endpoint. Again, pick up after from uh, the last returned object and repeat the loop. And GraphQL retrieved all the objects even faster than the REST API, about twice as fast. So this was the Cursor API, and you can read more about it in our uh, 118 release notes right here. Perfect. This was uh, pretty cool. Um, Dan, so ba basically, what, what's the idea of this? Like, so um, with the cursor API is the idea to be able to go through all of the data like in a really fast manner without like writing complicated queries, or what's the what's the idea? The main idea is that now you are able to access all objects in a class. Well, previously you are limited to ten objects for a query, so users had to craft these um, artificial wear filters to keep paginated for objects. But now you simply indicate the last, the ID of the last object you received in the after parameter and you get the next limit objects. So that lets you dump all objects in database or use it uh, as your primary source of truth. Nice, nice. So this this is cool, good. yeah. And um, definitely like looks like a super efficient way to like access a, a huge amount of data because I, I remember in the past, like if you just wanted like test out a few objects, this wasn't as fast. So yeah, even like on the on a sandbox environment, uh, like the, the speeds were pretty impressive. This is very fast because there's no uh, filtering. You, you simply fetch objects in batches. Nice, nice. So and then is the idea of the cursor API that because you have this after, you almost like go like here's my pointer start from here and kind of like fly in that direction? Is that where it comes exactly. from? Yeah. Ah, yeah, that cool. was my question is um, from the UIDs, how are they sorted? So when you go from after, it takes you to where are they like an order of how they got into the database? Like it's after it takes you from this UUID, how, how are they sorted? So they are in the order in which they were uh, inserted in WV8, mm -hmm. in the order of our creation. Interesting. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Nice. So I guess like even as the as you query the data and you modify the data, your cursor kind of stays consistent in one place. While if you were running like specific queries, suddenly the next page would have could have changed, right? If if something underneath changed. Yes, so. because it's based on IDs which are immutable. Uh, the order of objects returned by uh, this cursor API is um, guaranteed. Hmm. Nice, cool. nice. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, thanks for the demo. This this made it pretty uh, pretty uh, to the point, and 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 now I know how to use it. Like, uh, I can't wait to uh, mm -hmm. like. I I I almost said that I can't wait for this episode to end, but like, I, I, this this is definitely going to be something I'm gonna test out uh, after we go offline. So um, yeah, thanks a lot for the demo, Dan and um, Connor. Tell us Ooh. about want. Should I show your screen as well? Yeah, cool. Is it showing now? It is. I got the, because uh, <laughs> I have this going full screen, so I can't see everyone else anymore. All right, so I'm going to be talking about wand scoring. And there used to be this meme on Twitter that was like making GPUs go burr to talk about like running software fast. And so I had to borrow that for talking about like something that makes something faster. Okay, hey, so, so is that that's like a burr, like like a fast car or burr <laughs> on cold? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's like the sound of the machine. Like you, you imagine this like. <laughs> ah, right, like a, a purring cat machine. That's okay. I get that. Nice. Yeah. 
All right. So the TLDR of this is is with with BM25, we're scoring each of these keyword terms, and you only really need to score the unique terms to most of these queries. So that's the TLDR is, you know, if, if the query is how to catch an Alaskan Pollock, you probably only need to score Alaskan Pollock. You don't need to score how to, you know, and these kind of things. So so let's dive into the details of how you calculate the BM25 scores. And uh, so if you see my mouse, I'm like K1 and B, these are just like constants, like constant values that are used to kind of stabilize the algorithm. You might tune them, but let's kind of ignore that. Uh, so th the key things to look at here are, so this is the score of a document in the query is you loop through the terms in the query, and then you have the IDF for that query term, the Q sub I, and then, you know, the frequency of the query term in this document, you know, normalized by the same score and then by the, um, the length of the document divided by the average length of all your documents. And then you also have this IDF thing. This IDF thing is the most important thing. Well, let's just quickly explain why it is the most important thing. So with, with this other part of the equation, when you're doing the, uh, the frequency for the query in this given document, uh, th this, the key thing here is gonna be this document length and the average document length. So what that looks like is, let's imagine like one of our documents is just Pollock, it's just one word. This is like the most extreme case where you're kind of like gaming that cardinality of D thing. So you end up with one over 50. And so, you know, Pollock appears once. So it's one over one plus one over 50. And so again, we're gonna ignore these constants just to get the key ideas behind like what changes for each query. So you end up with one over one plus one over 50, which is less than one. So you're always gonna have some value that's less than one. And thus, the IDF is really where the payload comes in because, you know, you're, you're only getting at most just one, which is going to be the same as the IDF from this part of the BM25 calculation. All right. So the interesting thing is the IDF. So the key things in IDF are N, the total number of documents you have, and then N of the query term, which is how many times this term appears uh, in this um, uh, overall in all of the documents. So as some examples, let's say like, you know, just we have 20 documents and, you know, how appears in, so this is like the inverted index. You have how to catch N and then these are the document IDs that like th where it appears like just numerically. So, you know, to sum it up, how appears eight times, two, 12, catch four and 10, and then Alaskan only twice and Pollock only twice. So when you plug that into the, you know, N minus how many times it appears over how many times it appears, you end up getting like for the rare terms, 20 minus two over two is nine. Whereas for the common terms like two, you get like 20 minus 12 over 12, which is two thirds. So this, these, this is the IDF of each of these terms. How much can it possibly contribute to the BM25 score? So once you've been scoring this query, how to catch an Alaskan Pollock, you have a minimum threshold. So you score Pollock, it adds nine you know, to, to the, the documents that had Pollock. Alaskan then adds another nine and then catch adds another four. So then there's like a minimum threshold, right? And so let's say it's four now, the minimum distance after you've scored this many. So now these remaining terms, how and two, they can only possibly add 3.17 to the score. So the search is over. So all in all, what this leads to is just less uh, scoring calculations for scoring the BM25 and thus a faster you know, calculation of BM25 scores with this wand algorithm where you're using this minimum uh, threshold to prune it and say, no, forget it. It's not possible for this to add more to the score. So also uh, you can check this out if you're really interested in all the details behind exactly how this implemented is implemented. Uh, here's the link to the implementation in Golang. Cool. So that's why. Hey, I Connor, I've, I've got a question. So if you go back um, one, yeah, here, or no, the, the, the next one. So when, when does this happen where, where you kind of like score like Pollock, Alaskan and Cash? That's like, when we score like the the, mm -hmm. uh, the query level even before the query begins it, yeah when so is that hap when does that uh, happen yeah it, yeah so you can sort them by uh so so you have these lengths and mm -hmm. so you sort them in reverse order because you know it's like inversely the less it appears the more it can add to the score so yeah. you first you sort it and then you can uh compute the minimum threshold that, so exactly what how this is done with with the top k i'm not exactly sure of that detail but Basically, you sort it, and then you can like calculate what that threshold would be uh, based on having because you you uh, calculate these numbers by you you would have this number from the length of the inverted index, basically. Oh, 
Yeah. So basically, because I'm, I'm speaking, like, obviously, um, I'm, I'm new still to the field and everything, right? So I'm basically trying to figure out from the point of view of, so when does it happen? So does this happen at the time when, like, we import our data and we create this mm. index? Okay, yeah. The- yeah, n- no change to WeVate is needed. It, it can, this can just build right on the inverted index that you already have. You don't need to, say, upgrade WeVate to 1.18 and then re-import all your data. You can just... 117 or however to 118 and then just or i guess 117 is when bm25 came out but anyway so like 117 to 118 and you can just use this you don't need to re-index oh cool cool yeah nice and then like with this basically the, the bm25 search is just like smarter because it's just going to ignore words that just like keywords that don't really add much to the result right yeah it's like yeah you must do how like yeah that's basically every <laughs> single document i have right <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Nice, nice. Is the cool? I, I have a question. So, is my understanding correct that let's say you have a huge query, this is basically picking out the rarest words uh, in that query based on how rare those words are in your database, and then you order them from rarest to most common, and then you say, if I've got this many rare words, don't look for any other common words. And that removal of all of those common words from the scoring process is what speeds things up. Is that is that the correct understanding? Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think, um, well, you, you said something with that that made me question my understanding a little bit because if you, well, oh, so, okay, sorry. So yeah, yes, exactly. Because you do it with the query. If you have a, this is how to catch in Alaska, right? Like six words. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty easy to visualize it. I don't know what it was about what you just said that inspired me to think about like querying with like a paragraph. But if you're querying with like an entire paragraph, I mean, that would be an interesting test to run, I guess. I haven't really done that kind of test, but. That would be like a stress test of this, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because if you have like, let's say 20 common words, the sum total of that could end up being pretty high that it needs to keep doing it until. Yeah. 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 No, this is cool, right? Yeah. I, I, that's why I like with you there because like we're teaching to each other and then suddenly it's like, wait, what? Like, let me ask questions. <laughs> we should almost have like a follow-up session just like now testing out ideas. Yeah. Nice, mm-hmm. nice. Cool. Um, did you did you have anything else to add or what's, what's happening next? Oh, uh, yeah, this is all I have for uh, the wand. Oh, perfect. Thanks. Um, so okay. I want to give... Give a quick shout just uh, before I hand it over to you, Erica. So, like, uh, Karsten uh, is uh, saying hi from Karlsruhe in Germany. Uh, so, he's looking forward to using Weavit 118. He's like, um, yeah, like, uh, super excited to, to hear that and uh, let us know how it goes. And uh, Raj says, great stuff. So, um, yeah, thanks, Raj. Thank you for encouragement. So, um, yeah, anybody else, just, like, give us a shout. And, of course, right at the beginning, kind of was, like, stepping in, uh, thank you for watching. I think that you sent it before I even, you, even <laughs> I got to say it, right? So you're such a pro, Connor. <laughs> All right. So moving on, Erica. I'm so, taking the baton. Uh, yeah, let's do it, right? So you will be talking now about BM25 hybrid improvements, which is pretty close to the topic of one and the stuff that Connor was explaining, right? Yeah, exactly. So um, BM25 and hybrid um, was released in 117, and yesterday we released 118. Um, but really what we were focusing on was how can we improve BM25 and hybrid? So Connor went over one, and this was the simplest way to u- start using WAND and really apply it to large scale data and applications is just by upgrading a repeat instance, which is exactly what Connor said. So it's kind of cool that it's that simple to use it um, and see the performance improvements. Um, but what I'm covering today specifically is we added in stop word removals. Um, it's now indexed, um, whereas previously it was not. And then also adding, we added in the where filter um, to BM25 and hybrid. Um, I guess you can share my screen. I'm still talking a little bit to like kind of built it up, but um, <laughs> yeah, um, so absolutely. in 117, um, it, it ignored the stop word configuration and scored all of the words. So as you can imagine, if we are querying with a large paragraph and it has the and what uh, many times, it, can, it will be very slow. Um, so ignoring them speeds up queries that contain stop words as they can be automatically removed from queries as well. Um, and that's obviously important for stop words. So 
here I'm using the podcast search demo that I showed previously. Um, Connor built a GitHub repository, I'm using it. Um, but what I'm showing here is that you can use the REST API to update your stop words even after your data has already been indexed. Um, so here- oh, oh, wait, so are you saying that I already have an existing schema and then I can update it? Oh, neat. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, so here I have added in, so my data, I've already uploaded my data. It is indexed. I have my schema defined, but now what I'm showing is that we are adding in a few additional stop words, which is what the and is. And this preset is set to English, um, but you can also have none and then add in additional um, stop words in here. But then you can also add in, oh no, I removed it really quick. Um, <laughs> You can also add in. Hey, this is how you navigate through our documentation. <laughs> Just live. A little preview. Um, so here you can also have removal. So if you do want to include a or the, this is where you would define that. All right. Ah. So, so like the opposite of ignore is like ignore. Hey, include it too. <laughs> include it. Yes, exactly. All right. So I'm going to um, run this. And then I'm going to head over to my V1 schema, refresh it. And what you can see is I the additional is what. And as you can see previously, I had added in the and is. But because it's already included in the English preset, um, the only new one that was added in is just what. And that's really. Hey, Erica, could you zoom in a little bit just, oh, just to course. make it bigger? Yeah. I'm so sorry. This is what I'm no referring worries. to. <laughs> nice. And then you could you. Uh, the preset of English. Hey, does that mean we could um, mess up with Connor's example and like add Alaskan and Pollock to to the list, and then he's he would never get the results ever again? Yes, that's a good little like, secret. Can we do it, <laughs> Connor? Can we? Or here, why no, don't you we need add the, in? You need the da well. Yeah. You need yeah. the database. The database to have something about Alaskan Pollock in it. Yeah. As in, we're right. not going to necessarily test that query, right? But like, I, I just want to see how easy it is to just add additional words now, now that you've done it. Yeah. So here I've added in beer and release because I know that's talked about frequently on the podcast. And then I'm just going to run this again and then refresh. And I can see that it was added in <laughs> to the stock variable. Um, so yeah, the results, it wouldn't be in your favor if you accidentally did this. Um, yeah. You, you're just too nice for Connor. Like, you didn't want to mess up with, with, with his Alaskan Pollocks, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but this is cool how fast this, this, this update. So can you can you tell us, like, what happens underneath, right? Like, when we add these additions, do these keywords get removed from the sparse vector? Or sparse, is, is that the right, right word as well? It's well, it'd be like, inspectors. Well, now the stop words, what is different from 118 is that they are indexed, but when you are querying in BM25, they are um, removed for relevance ranking because if it's going to rank the and and, it's kind of going to boost results even if that's not really what you're looking for. So the key yeah. here is just kind of to remove those, um, like uh, the relevance ranking for the and and, like, or beer and release or what, <laughs> this example. Sounds good. Yes. Um, all right. So, and then the next thing that I want to show is the where filter. So we have finally added it in for BM25 and hybrid. Um, but just with this example, I'm taking the pod clip and I'm asking a query on what were the features released in 117. And just similarly um, to 117, this works, right? But what is new is the where filter, which is great. I will show the ticket that had, like, I think, 30 updates. Um, so what do I want? I know that Connor, Eddian, and Parker talked about um, the 117 release and podcast 31. So I will just narrow it down to the pod num. Sorry. Okay. And then operator is equal. And then just my value int of 31. So now, as you can see, all the pod numbers are referring to podcast 31. And this is where we have Connor speaking. Connor speaking a lot. Oh, but then we have Eddie as well. That is related to talking about the features that were released in 117. So you can see that the main focus for that podcast was talking about replication and hybrid search. Um, yeah. Wow. So um, 
we're basically combining three kinds of search uh, like filters, right? So we have vector search, like we have the BM25 search because of hybrid, and then we have scalar search. Dang, that's, that's pretty the cool. Possibilities. Yeah, and what I want to <laughs> highlight here is that this feature was built off of a request by someone in the community, uh, Zoltan Federer. Um, this had 34 upvotes, which is insane. So I just want to make a point that if you want to contribute to the features that will be plan um, included in 119 or even 120, um, you can head over to the developers docs. And then on the bottom here, we have the roadmap. And you can click on it and you'll be taken to the GitHub uh, proposal and then you can upload it. So please, this is the time as we're planning for 119, um, your voice matters. <laughs> you Absolutely. I mean, I, I can give you some like a secret uh, Intel that I know like uh, so Etienne, our CTO, uh, he's actually planning to like uh, look at uh, some of those items in the backlog uh, and then some of those more popular ones would definitely get a lot more attention from Etienne. So very much like Erica said, like uh, we are very much like roadmap and feedback driven. And if you feel like uh, there's something that's very important there, give it an upvote, give it just like that, right? <laughs> Erica believes this one is very important, right? So uh, yeah, just just like Erica said, but like my, my point is like, uh, you could do it like right now, like even this week, because you could uh, influence what will go into 119 or maybe 120. So um there's no time like now, right? Yes. Nice, nice. Cool. Awesome. This Thank this you. was pretty uh, pretty amazing. Thank you for the demo, Erica. Okay. Anyone have any other questions? One question I had was, how does the removal of stop words work with the um, the rarity of words and then ignoring the non-rare words? Because I would imagine the stop words would be the non-rare words, and then if those are removed then whatever's left over, does that does that make Connor's point even stronger? Because now you don't have a lot of garbage, uncommon words. Stop words takes care of that. Now the uncommon words are even, um, they're, they're, I guess removing those is even more powerful now. Right? Is, am I understanding that correctly? Or? I mean, yeah, it's like in the example, if we remove the bottom three, now the least common, I guess, would be catch, right? Or the most common that has like the less weight would be catch. So it really puts mm. that focus on Pollock and Alaskan. Ah, so the these two features are kind of synergistic because the the wand update doesn't need to take uh, take care of a bunch of common words. The stop word update gets rid of those. And then you really focus in on the most important words. Yeah. Actually, the, the way I understood it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody here, but like it's almost like it gives us an ability to kind of uh, say which words should be completely ignored. But let's say you have a furniture company. Uh, so then what uh, Connor was explaining, matching to a chair, because basically chairs will probably be mentioned like once every 10 times, like uh, we have like an item in the catalog. So matching to a chair wouldn't be so important because of want. But at the same time, we still still will be a valuable match, right? But then a specific kind of chair, right? Like that could have like, a, you know, just like uh, Ikea and other companies are doing, right? Like uh, that they have a name. So because those will be rarer, like in terms of how often they appear, they will appear even more. But I think with like the, the stop words itself, you could kind of go like, you yeah, just ignore every time somebody says wood or, or something like you could even have like terms that go like, yeah, like I, I don't value these matches so much or, or like at all. And I think that could be your way, right? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. The co the stop words feature gets rid of generally common things, and then the uh, the part that the TFIDF part that Connor was talking about. Then, after having removed the generally common words, now it says of the interesting words, which ones are rare and which ones are common. So it's even yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Sebastian. Yeah, totally. So you know, like. Um... Uh, I, I'm sure if you ever been to Ikea and were buying a bookshelf, so matching to a bookshelf, like you'll give it like a small score. But if you say Billy, like, yeah, that would get like a pretty high score, right? Like, uh, and uh, I'm sure that anybody's ever been to Ikea and knows what's a B Billy bookshelf. bookshelf. <laughs> no? Interesting. <laughs> Maybe I have too many books. <laughs> 
great, great. This this is amazing. This is great. And um, I love the addition of, of the wear filter. Um, that's definitely been very needed. And uh, yeah, perfect. So any, anything else that you want to cover? No, that's all of my end. I'll pass it over. <laughs> perfect. So um, who have we got next? So we have HNSW and PQ. Um, who was oh, doing that? That's me. If you could share my screen. Absolutely. There you go. All right. Oops. Okay. Let me show your face again. <laughs> All right. So let me jump into it. So 1.18 adds this uh, new vector compression feature called product quantization. And it works with uh, our, uh, our HNSW index. And it essentially makes it so that you can store your vectors in memory with one fourth the requirements. That one fourth uh, can change depending on the parameters for PQ that you set. So I want to give just a, a quick five minute intro to what PQ is and how you might be able to use it. Okay, so imagine that is one vector that you're storing. So this can be any any dimensional vector. Okay? What PQ does, what we do right now is we store this vector and we have millions like this that are being stored in memory, uh, which takes a lot of memory. Right? What PQ allows you to do is the very first thing you do is you chunk up your vector into n segments. That's one parameter. So you choose whether you want eight segments or 100 segments. The upper limit there is the dimensionality of the of the vector, of course. You can't have more segments than you ha have dimensions. Uh, then you take each segment. And let's just have a look at the first segment for now. You do the same thing with every segment, but let's consider the first segment. And let's take the first segment of all of your vectors. So I've just drawn two vectors there, but imagine you these are all of your vectors. You take all of the first segments of your vectors and you plot them out. Right? So the first vector is there, the third vector is there, and then all of the other vectors contribute their first segments as well. Uh, now what we're going to do is instead of pay attention to where each vector is located, which takes a lot of space, we're going to create neighborhoods of vectors. So I'm going to create this neighborhood where these two vectors live together this neighborhood where only this vector lives, this neighborhood where this vector lives. And then so now that we've got these larger uh, neighborhoods, these clusters of vectors, instead of defining the vector uniquely using its coordinates here, what we're instead going to do is define these neighborhoods using their centroids. And this is where the second parameter comes in, which is k. You can decide how finely you want to segregate these uh, vectors by saying, I want a lot of neighborhoods, I want a thousand neighborhoods, or you can say, I want 20 neighborhoods. So there's going to be very, very large neighborhoods. You're going to have a lot more vectors per neighborhood. Right? But the whole idea is that every neighborhood gets its own uh, centroid, which has a coordinate, and it has its own ID. Right? Now, instead of referring to a piece of a vector, this first segment uh, of vector one, by the coordinates that are unique to it, we're instead going to take those coordinates, and we're going to replace it with the centroid ID for this centroid. So any vector that lives in that neighborhood will now not be referred with its unique coordinates, but rather with a centroid ID. So instead of having to store all of these numbers, now you're just storing the name for that centroid. And this is where the memory saving comes in. So if you have your database to begin with, you've got right now, this is what you have. PQ is going to chunk, that, chunk this up and it's going to do the same calculation over and over again for every segment. And it's going to turn this first segment here into a centroid ID, the second segment here into a centroid ID. And if you implement this over your uh, entire uh, entire database, you'll have just all these segments now chunked up into centroid ID. So instead of having to store numbers here, you only have to store uh, uh, centroid IDs instead. And if you understood none of that, let me just abstract all the details away and let's let's uh, get uh, down to just the intuition. Let's say every vector is an address uh, that you're storing. So you can have the house number, the street uh, number, you can have which uh, neighborhood I'm living in, what state I'm in, what country I'm in, so on and so forth. And then all the way at the top, I'm living in on planet Earth. PQ allows you to zoom out and say, I don't really care about the house number. I don't really care about the street number. I only care about the state that Zane is living in. Uh, 
And now you're going to have a bunch of people that live in the same state. So you have a coarser representation for each vector, but that coarser representation allows you to save on memory requirements, right? So some of the experimentation that we've done uh, allows you to save one, uh, save uh, and store the vectors in one fourth the memory requirement. So that's one fourth the RAM previously required. Um, so that's a speed up, but it's it doesn't come for free, right? So the one thing that you have to balance when you're using PQ is that the lower, uh, the more you compress the vectors, the lower you get the memory, you're paying for that in terms of recall, because now you're summarizing vectors in terms of the neighborhood that they live in using those centroids. Right? So it, it is a balance between how much recall you need versus uh, how much memory uh, savings you want to you want to realize. So that's a quick summary of, uh, of PQ and that works with uh, HNSW. You can look into documentation and um, by default, we don't enable PQ uh, and it's experimental right now, but if you wanna play around with it, you can enable, set the enable flag uh, underneath PQ in the configuration to true. And there's a bunch of other uh, details and settings that you can play around with in the configuration. You can read more about that in the docs and Sebastian will add the link to the docs in the, in the description of the video as well. I have a question. Yeah. Nice, really quick. So I guess if we want to find like a balance of the higher recall and lower memory, is there like a, how could we optimize K where we could have like a balance between the two? Uh, so it would depend on the size of your vectors really, because the, the lower K is, you're basically saying, if I go back here, you're basically saying, if you decrease K to one, you're saying, identify the address of a person uh, using one centroid, and that'll just be, okay, this person lives on Earth, which is not very yeah. helpful. And so the recall is going to take a major, major hit. It's going to be horrible. But then you could say, okay, I, I can afford to have more memory. So I, now I'll zoom in further. I'll, I'll, I'll give everybody their own neighborhood. I'll give everybody their address. So it's a, there's a work, there's actually a blog post that's going to come out next week around the details of this. So you can read more about the balance between memory saving and recall. Um, there is a cutoff that we'll mention there where you can compress it down and then it, to a certain degree, which is this one fourth, um, after which the, the price and recall that you pay is not worth it. So there's like a diminishing return at some point. Exactly. So it does plateau yeah. off. So that's a that's the good thing. So you can keep on compressing the vectors. And then you, when you see recall taking a very big hit, that's when you know where the cutoff is. Nice. Loved your explanation. And this circle, it's like, okay, how many cases? Great job. Yeah. yeah, I want to also hop in and firstly say the slides were great. I love the whole presentation. I, I love how you put the uh, the chunks into the points as well. That was awesome. Can we, can we go back to that slide, actually? With the uh, with the two going into the point, yeah, I love how you animated in the regions. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, if I have a video for this, that'd be great. But I don't have a video, so let's just make a PowerPoint video. So, yeah, we nice. should turn that into a GIF and like tweet it. Yeah. Um, the funny thing was like when initially you had just like the, those two arrows pointing out, uh, like, and they were not pointing at anything. And I was like, what are those arrows, arrows pointing at? And I was like, wait, wait, those are vectors. They're not just arrows, right? Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, what? penny drop. <laughs> <laughs> they're not arrows, they're vectors. Um, hey, so you mentioned at the beginning that is there, are there two parameters or is there one parameter? Like, is there K and the dimensionality we want or? Yeah, so N is a parameter here. How many segments uh, you want to yeah. cut, the, cut the vector up into. And then for each one of those segments, the second parameter is this guy, right? How many centroids to look for, for each segment. Yeah, so, so like almost, okay. So let me think about it. So if I have my vector that has 1,024 dimensions, and I could say, like, I want to shrink it down to 32 dimensions, right? So that's the end, end, end uh, value. Yeah. Would so that mean that I would 1, end up with 30? Yeah, go on. For, for 1,024 dimensional vector, if you want each one of these segments to be 32 dimensional, then you would have to set N to 1,024 divided by 32. And N has to be a constant multiple so that each you don't have, like, a, a portion of a, a vector dimension hanging in one segment and, and the other half hanging in the other segment. Wait, so is there a reverse where if I want to actually have 32 segments, so I have to do a calculation of what's the N or? 
Well, if can you want to have a 32 equals... dimensional segment, then you have to do a yeah. calculation of how what the end should be. Yeah. Oh no, I just want 32 segments, right? So, um, okay. So if I have then 32 segments, uh -huh. do I get a centroid per segment or the centroid is just calculated based on this reduced vector? You get, you get K centroids per segment. So every, every segment is going to have these vectors and then you calculate, let's say uh, 124 centroids per segment. So each one of these guys is going to, this is going to be 124 centroids. This is going to be a hundred and separate, different 124 centroids. And you can also choose how, uh, what that K is, right? One, uh, 124 or 500, 1000. Okay, okay. Because I, I felt like um, the biggest memory saving is in in a space of like how much we compress the the vectors themselves, right? So if I initially started with 1024 and I shrunk it to 32, that's just like a tiny fraction, right? Then uh, yeah. So here, if you if you have less segments, then you will eventually have uh, less centroids overall because. Here, let's say you have 10 segments, and for each segment, you have 100 centroids. You have 1,000 centroids in total. But let's say you only have two segments, then you only have 200 centroids. Right? So that's a, that's a cost saving in memory. But then also how many centroids each segment has, if you reduce that, that's also a cost saving. So you can yeah, take yeah. the memory down to being nothing, and you'll have no recall. That's why it's a, it's a, it's a delicate balance. Yeah. And then, OK, so that, that's this part. And then later on, when I do run a query, on like on those reduced vectors yeah um so what happens like first we go to a neighborhood based on the centroid of our query yeah. we pick all the candidates but then the scoring and the distance calculated based on the full vector right so that is uh if you read the paper on disk ann um that's how it works but right now that full vector is not uh stored um uh, on disk that that might be a feature that we implement in the future, but how distancing calculations work right now is you can take a vector and then you find out which neighborhood that vector mm -hmm. resides in. And then you can calculate the distance between, let's say there's a new, let's say this is a new uh, query vector. You find out that it lives in this neighborhood for the first segment. You, you know the centroid, you know the coordinates of the centroid. You can calculate the distance between the query vector and the centroid. And you do that for every centroid in every segment. Um, the, another uh, future work uh, right now is you can actually store the complete vector representations on disk, which is much cheaper. And then if you want to do distance calculations, you can bring them into, uh, into working memory and calculate uh, exact distances if you have the complete vectors. But right now, we don't have the complete vectors. We just have the compressed vectors if you enable PQ. Cool, cool. Yeah, I always mix up that detail of whether the compressed vectors are compressed in. I, my understanding is that they're compressed in memory, and then their fully represented vectors are on disk. Yeah. So, and then you would um, you decompress them with some error, and and then look for the nearest neighbors on disk. I always mix up that detail. Maybe. Yeah, from what from what I understand, the main uh, RAM savings come from the fact that your compressed vectors are stored in uh, in working memory in RAM and the full representations are stored on disk. So you do your high level search in memory and then once you have your best candidates, then you go to disk, you read them in and then you can do more fine tuned exact searching over those limited candidates. All right, yeah, so basically that that's what I meant with my question. So yeah, because that yeah, the saving is like instead of set, uh, storing 10 million 1024 uh, dimensions big uh, uh, vectors i can store 10 million 32 exactly. big so that's like 32 times less exactly. uh, uh, memory footprint but then once i found the initial candidates based on the uh, the neighborhood we can kind of like go in and then score them based on the full vector right exactly yeah but but then because the first trip is like super fast um we can kind of like uh, take the heat of doing a, a disk read as a, as a one-off and then do that distance calculation. Yeah. This is powerful stuff. So I have a question um, and, I'm, and I realized there were also questions um, from, from stop words, but, uh, we, but first let's, let's uh, talk about PQ. So Raj is asking, uh, well, oh, first it's, it's very cool, small question. Uh, will PQ affect the time taken for vector search performance on large indexes like 
15 mil plus vectors. So it um, vector search performance on large uh, indexes. This is so the the blog that we're uh, planning on releasing next week actually looks at uh, uh, latency considerations as well. But mainly the idea behind this is not uh, not to uh, it's not going to take longer or shorter. But the main idea is that you need less memory requirements. Right? So PQ is not going to um, it might take a little bit longer um, because you have to do this uh, reading in from memory uh, type of thing that I described, uh, which we're looking at in the future. But the main trade off here is not latency, um, latency and uh, recall, which is the which is the main case. in let me go back to my slide here in in HNSW, the main trade off is recall and latency. Here, the trade off that you have to decide is how much recall do you want to trade for being able to save memory? So it's more around uh, memory space requirements as opposed yeah. to time requirements. That's so what performance doing. should be more as fine. Uh, we've got also a question, and probably we don't have this right now, right? But um, how, do we know if we're planning on sharing is, some benchmarks? This is what uh, we're going to talk about this in the blog post uh, next week where we do a deep dive on PQ. So look forward to that, and then uh, we'll also have uh, more details then. Yeah, so thank you for questions, Raj and Vinod. And uh, yeah, just just keep keep an eye on our blog post then, uh, because uh, as far as I, 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 I remember as well, the plan is to even post two separate blog posts on the topic because there's so much to talk about. Uh, but thank you for sharing the questions because that also helps us shape some of that content. And um, yeah, next week, Tuesday, we should have that blog, the, the first uh, blog post from the series. Um, so this is really cool. Um, yeah. Any other questions around PQ before we move on? There you go. Thanks, Raj, for, yeah, no worries. Uh, thank you for asking. This is why uh, I love this whole session being live. Cool. Okay. So let's go back to um, the, the topic with stop words uh, if we are done here. And so we had a question, well, First, this is not a question, you know, this is a shout out. So uh, uh, thank you. We really appreciate it. It makes us even happier uh, to, to work on it. And I will definitely pass it on uh, within the company. Uh, so let's look at the actual question. So are there any tr performance trade-offs to consider when adding a large number of stop words? Do we, do we know? Or is that a question we should probably get back to later? That's an interesting question, but also uh, thanks for the compliment. And like Sebastian said, it'll be shared with the team. Um, but um, I'm not sure. I mean, I know Connor's working on the beer benchmarks, um, and maybe there is a data set within that that has where you can add in a large number of stop words and then kind of compare the performance. Um, but previously, with the demo that I used for podcast search, I was looking into the natural questions, which is within the um, beer data set. Um, and it's kind of tricky because there aren't really that many stop words and the performance, I didn't really see a difference when I removed it, but maybe Connor has something to add to this. Um, I, well, I think it's, I, I think the kind of customized stop words is probably best for like uh, multi like uh, low resource languages, languages where you need that kind of domain expertise. That's probably where I would, where I in interpret it as the, having the most application um because you'd be tuning a really long list of words to try to like speed up the beer benchmarks particularly yeah, yeah. I, I think what we're looking at is because maybe the stop words by themselves are not about like making querying faster but the, the real true benefit is can they make your results better right because by ignoring the, the wrong stuff, like the stuff that you don't want necessarily to be part of the query, you can get better results, better results. But maybe, and that's something maybe we just have to test out and we can come back next time round as like seeing like, hey, what, is, what, is, what would happen if I had like a thousand stop words? Would that affect the performance, right? So not so much like, would that make it faster, but would that, could that potentially make it slower? That would be an interesting thing to figure out. And I'm sure if Etienne was on the call or, or like someone from engineering, they would have had the answer straight away. So maybe next time we should have them on, on online. 
Cool, cool. All right. Thank you uh, for the questions. And, you know, like this is part of being live, you know, sometimes there are questions we don't have the answers straight away, but uh, we can always figure out. Maybe you can add the answers to the documentation uh, once we figure it out. So that would be cool. Perfect. So who have we got? What have we got next? So we covered um, BM25, HSW, and then now we will talk about the update to the replica, yeah, replication update with tunable consistency and repair on read. Um, I believe that's done, right, Dan? That would be me, indeed. So Do you in need me version... to share your screen? Oh, yeah. I can uh, show the documentation. Uh, there's no demo, but um, I can show a few graphics that hopefully will help you understand replication, especially if you haven't been following along. Uh, we introduced replication in the previous version, 117, and uh, in this version, we enrich the feature set. So to help you understand uh, what happened in this version, um, I'll briefly go over what replication is. Essentially, you can replicate an object in a class to a number of nodes. So in this diagram, you can look at the, um, the class A, for instance. Let's say it's A for article. And you see that out of the six nodes here, three of them have this uh, green marker. So that means every object in uh, the class is replicated on three nodes and three is the replication factor. And replication is useful for a number of use cases. Uh, first being high availability. If a node goes down, your setup still functions. Then you can uh, linearly increase throughput by adding nodes. You can also upgrade with no downtime. Uh, you take one node out and the others will still uh, process and return results. Original proximity is obviously helped. And um, when you build a distributed database with replication, you have to choose two out of three properties. One of them is consistency, which means you get the latest version of an object that was written on every read. The other is, the other is availability. It means you always get a response, even if uh, some nodes are down. And uh, the other is partition tolerance, which means the system will still function if uh, nodes individually do not. And uh, the, um, the trade-offs between consistency and availability is what you can uh, control all operations now in version 118. So this is called tunable consistency. And there are three values for this. The first one is one, which means that a read or a write will return as soon as one of the nodes responds. Quorum, which means that your request will return after a majority of nodes respond. Majority means half of the replication factor plus one. And then finally we have all, which means all nodes in the replica set must respond. So we wait to use this all for schema operations to ensure um, full consistency. But for um, reads or writes over the REST API, you can choose between one quorum or all. Uh, for GraphQL, we do not support consistency that's tunable yet, but this might be implemented in a future version. And to visualize how this works, um, we can look at the quorum consistency level. So in this diagram, you have um, the replication coordinator node that receives a request from the client and it sends it out to n nodes, the replication factor. So here is three. You have three arrows going out and you can notice that only two arrows come back. So that means a majority of nodes have responded. The replication coordinator node is happy and returns the result to the client. Uh, there are um, a number of scenarios for consistency versus availability that you can choose from. So quorum and quorum for reason and writes will give you uh, a balanced write and read latency. Or if you need fast writes and slow reads, you can choose one for writes. So you only wait for one node to respond before the write is acknowledged. And then um, all reads means that you have to wait for all the nodes to respond before you get the result. Or if you need the fast reads, you invert those. So you have uh, the all consistency level for writes and one for reads. So that would be tunable consistency. And uh, then we have uh, repairs. So imagine uh, a scenario like this. Um, you write an object with a consistency level one, and that node dies before it can uh, propagate your object to the other nodes. 
So in that case, when uh, you read the object, again, with the consistency, le consistency level one, it's possible that uh, you'll hit another node, not the one that accepted the write. So in that case, you might uh, not get the object at all, or if you had a patch operation, you would get the previous version of it. But if you had used consistency level all for that read, that means we will uh, wait for all nodes to return, and it will see that one of the nodes did have your new object or the updated one, while the others didn't have it. So then it would automatically propagate the changes or the creation to the other nodes, and it will return the latest version. So this is called the last write wins um, model for solving consistency conflicts, and it's what we it uses. And uh, we explain here in the consistency documentation page what happens when you write an object and then when you want to guarantee that um, it has been propagated. So essentially, you need to read it with a high enough consistency level compared to the one that was used when writing the object. That's essentially it. Um, you can uh, check out the um, blog release on replication. And here we cover both the number of consistency updates and repair on read. Cool. Um, I got a question. So where do you add this configuration or like where do you provide like, you know, say like I want to use quorum versus all or majority? Uh, this, um, so this is used um, in uh, the REST API. Uh, for every write, every read and every write endpoint. Ah. For example, when you get, uh, when you create an object, you can specify the consistency level here. Ah, cool. Is, is there a way to change the default behavior? I'm, I'm not sure how, if you went over that. Uh, um, the default is quorum, I should have mentioned this, and uh, mm -hmm. there's no way to change that. You change it per operation. Okay, okay. Right. And uh, it's supported by all nodes, uh, sorry, all endpoints, which means also creating cross references supported. Again, you can specify the consistency level here and also for uh, batch operations. Interesting. Cool, cool. Perfect. Any questions from maybe from the audience? Hey, we got a question. So, uh, Dan, what replication protocol al algorithm does Weavid use? Do you, do you have the answer? What replication protocol does Weavid That's something um, pretty low level. I cannot answer it right now, but I'll get back to the user on Slack if they are there, and we can update the documentation as well. Yeah, that'll be a good question. Like, yeah, if you're part of like, like our Slack, maybe drop it on general, and then we could definitely uh, come back to it. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? Any other questions in here or from the audience? Perfect. Um, it, it definitely shows uh, who wrote the documentation on this because uh, you you are so good, like uh, walking over to the content. <laughs> It's almost as if you wrote it yourself. I uh, wink, wink. <laughs> nice, nicely done. Cool. All right. So, who have we got next? So, on the list of topics, uh, we have roaring beatmaps, and I believe that is Zen. Zen, I'm going to share your screen, and yeah. you can take it away. Sounds good. <clears throat> Okay, so roaring bitmaps are, um, we've implement, implemented a new uh, data structure in our inverted index. So before I kind of drown you in jargon, let's start off at the top. So what do these do? Um, so they essentially speed up filtered search up to 1000x. And the 1000x is the attention grabber here. We've ran some uh, experiments where we've got 1000x improvements. Then what the heck are pre-filtered searches? Pre-filtered searches are basically, uh, think of, let's say you're running an e-commerce store and you've got 10,000 unique items that are up for sale 
in your e-commerce store, a user comes in and they ask for, they have a search query, they're looking for furniture, you're not going to run that query against all 10,000 unique items that you have in your store. You're going to pre-filter the search such that you only look for uh, look at items, let's say 2,000 items that are in the furniture uh, category. Okay? So you pre-filter the search such that you don't have to look over 8,000 items. You drop those out at the, at the outset. So how um, WeV8 works is we have an inverted index that has a reference to every object. So it's essentially just a list of unique uh, item identifiers. And then there's the HNSW index that we talked a little bit about uh, when we talked about HNSW PQ, which allows you to do vector search, approximate nearest neighbor search. So the inverted index is what uh, we've modified with this Roaring Bitmaps update. And what it essentially allows you to do is the inverted index is now implemented using the Roaring set data structure. And the efficiency that this unlocks is if you've got a filter, let's say you're looking for uh, items that are of furniture type in my, in my store and above a particular price, uh, those operations are really efficient uh, when done using this new data structure. And the other thing, the other speed up is that because we natively implement the inverted index using the Roaring Set data structure, we don't have to convert into the uh, new Roaring Set data structure uh, when we have a filter. So we save on latency uh, of, of that conversion as well. Okay. Uh, and mainly where we see that 1000x improvement is if you've got a filtered search where the allow list, the allowable uh, or the interesting uh, items to search over. So in my previous example, if the user had a question about furniture and they were searching over furniture, the allow list would include the 2000 furniture items and not the 8000 remaining other items like clothing, hygiene products, all that stuff, right? So this allow list, where you get that 1000x improvement is if the allow list is basically your entire database. So imagine somebody goes into Amazon and searches for opens up a filter and says, search for items that cost more than a dollar. Your allow list is going to have everything in there because barely anything costs less than a dollar. So now your allow list is basically your entire database. This is the same as running non-filtered search. You're running, every query has to go through every single object in your database, uh, which is really slow. And the problem is that because it's implemented as a filtered search, you're still going to filter everything and the filter is not going to have any effect. It just adds a bunch of latency. And this is where the, uh, the time savings are realized, right? If you had previously a huge uh, allowed list where your filter was all encompassing your entire database, we would first of all generate the filter, which would be useless, but we would still do it. And then we would convert that filter and send that to HNSW and it would search over all of those, uh, all of those vectors. Right? And that's, where, that's what would take a, a lot of time. In terms of what this means, um, if you've already got your uh, inverted index in, in the previous data structure in 1.17, you can choose to stay on the old inverted index. You don't have to migrate, but you won't get the 1000x um, speed improvement, especially for these very large allow list um, queries. But what you can do is you can choose to do a one-time migrate, and that will uh, change your inverted index and will convert it into this uh, roaring bitmap data structure. And after that, it's a one-time uh, change. And after that, you'll have uh, a speedier uh, filtered searches. And hey, Zen, um, yeah. quickly. So you say, like, we can st stay on the old inverted index. Is it by, like, I can upgrade to 118 and still stay on the old index? Exactly. Right? So you, okay. can, you can upgrade to 118, and you can still stay on, uh, on the old inverted index. Or you can, there's a migrate option where you can choose to migrate your, uh, your um, inverted index to... Uh, using roaring bitmaps, and then uh, your 118 will actually, you'll see the one, uh, the thousand X uh, improvements. Yeah. And of course, like the, the 1000 X is really for like a large data set. Yeah, right? exactly. So my data be... sets have like a thousand objects. It's like, yeah. yeah. So your allow list is, is of a thousand. That's not yeah. so big when it's like 9 million. Yeah. Yeah. Like, let me show you an example. So this is a, a, a screen grab from uh, what Etienne uh, tweeted earlier. Uh, there's a bunch of details here um, that, that are not as relevant, but 
what I wanted to point out here is, let's say you have estimate, estimated matches of where your allow list is almost the entire database of a database of 10 million. It's 9.99 million. Um, in 1.17, this query would take five and a half seconds. The same query in 1.18 takes three milliseconds. Right? Um, and then as your allow list uh, size decreases, your, uh, your search uh, time decreases, but you can see that it's always an improvement. It's just strictly an improvement. It never makes anything worse because uh, the, the new data structure uh, is much more efficient in, um, uh, in, in the calculations that need to be computed. That's everything that nice. I had. And I even see some examples because obviously, like sometimes it's sort of like stays like there was like seven milliseconds before it's seven milliseconds now, and then it's like like one thousand sort of like roughly because yeah, going from five thousand four hundred that's like more than a thousand, but then there is some others when it's not not as a thousand, right? Uh, so, but definitely, I guess the key here is like hey you're working on 10 million objects or more, like you want to get like a, t a billion objects in. Yeah, yeah that could be super, uh, super useful. Yeah. And I believe for this one, the reason why it doesn't budge is because this is unfiltered search. So it's not, it, it's not, you're not using the filter um, anyways in this. Oh yeah. So it's fast by default anyway. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Good point. I didn't look closely enough. Um, but I think that there's like a couple of benefits to it. Like not only that the queries are fast, but also if suddenly your users start throwing uh, loads of queries that have like a huge allow list, then you could overload your servers, right? Like suddenly your servers are less responsive because these few people started asking very wide and broad questions, right? Yeah. Like show me all those items over $1. Um, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like, come on, please don't kill my server. <laughs> So like now there is a way to kind of like protect yourself from that in a way. Yeah. Nice, I love it. And um, do we have any guidance as to how you do that one-off upgrade to, to this? Because like, why wouldn't you want that? Yeah, that should that's in the docs. So when you, uh, when you uh, upgrade, you can, in configurations, there is a uh, migration option if you set that then your database goes into read-only mode and it's basically uh, generating this, uh, it's converting the old inverted index into this new roaring bitmap uh, implemented inverted index. For, at that point, it's only read-only, so you can't add anything to it. But once it's converted, then everything goes back to normal and you realize the speed ups that, that are shown here. Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, some comments before we move on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Raj sends us a couple of rockets. So uh, I guess we, we go into the moon. Um, Yuri has a question, is this default for new classes? So if we are on 118 and we create a new class, um, yeah. yeah, so automatically we'll get that, right? Yeah. For new classes, right. this is by default. If, you're, if you have a class predefined before this one, then you have to migrate over. Perfect. Well, and you don't have I to, show... you can choose to, I mm -hmm. should say. You don't have to, you can choose to. Or even better, you get to. You get to. <laughs> you get to, right? Um, yeah, and Etienne says hi. So if we have like some really tough questions, like we could always like uh, ask him, you know, to help out or heck, you know, we could even add him to the stream. And Yuri has a follow-up question. So like how long does the upgrade take? So like half a million objects. Do we have any idea, anyone? That's a, that's an Etienne question, I guess. He's he's run the experiments. I'm not sure exactly how long the migration would take. Hey, let's uh, let's uh, pray to 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 Etienne. You know, oh holy Etienne. You know, can you send us an answer? <laughs> I, I hope there is not much of a delay on the on the stream then. Um, yeah, but uh, while Etienne is thinking and figure out, um, is that is I don't know if I interrupted you in the middle or if it was towards the end. Oh no, this is everything. I think this is my last slide. Yeah, this is it. Ah, I timed my rude interruption well. Now, th th this is super exciting. And there's something, by the way, I want to add, like um, I, I was talking to some um, uh, somebody influential like recently, I don't necessarily want to name them right now, um, but uh, like uh, they, they were super excited about roaring bitmaps. It was, they, they're like, you, do, do you know that you'll be like the first database to have half roaring bitmaps implemented? 
And um, it, to me, it was like really impressive. Like, because I was thinking like, wow, we really are at the forefront of like that innovation, you know, like somebody came up with that idea. Uh, we, we discovered it and then, uh, you know, bank, you know, a couple of months later, uh, we have it implemented in Weviate and then everybody else can um, can take full advantage of it, you know, just like just upgrade to the latest version um, and then you know, upgrade your uh, index. And then here we are. This is pretty amazing. Yeah, what's super interesting to me, I, I was watching the podcast with uh, Connor and Etienne uh, on the 1.18 release. Um, this is not just, we're not doing it the old way and then we have a roaring bitmap. The inverted index is completely now, the, the internal guts are shifted so that it's implemented using the roaring set data structure. Um, to have that radical, a radical of a shift and uh, like that, that just shows that super nimble super flexible right we realize that yeah. there's a better way to do things boom done like the, the internal guts are completely converted that's that's so awesome yeah it, it's amazing that you can do that you know uh without like introducing breaking changes or any of that right so um coming back to the original question from uh not not, not this one oh missed it so like how long would this take so at the end run some tests and then my, he migrated 10 million objects and then that took 10 minutes. So basically, and that's just like a, on a local local machine. Well, granted, uh, Etienne's machine is uh, super powerful, um, but, but still it's like um, you could sort of estimate, you know, half a minute maybe for half a million objects. Uh, so it's not a, not a hefty operation to do that. Um, that could be kind of cool. Oh, there's a follow-up. Don't ask why I migrated 10 million objects lo locally. I wanted to import for a de demo case of bitmaps, but accidentally imported into 117. Nicely done, you know. Living dangerously, at the end. Living dangerously. Perfect. And we get a rocket from Uri. Hey, we collected three rockets today. Like, uh, I hope that uh, by the end we are done with the final segment, we'll have more rockets even. Who knows? All right, so any other questions or should we move on? I uh, take the silence as uh, a nodding as like the final segment. Cool, so I am going to take uh, the final segment and I'd like to talk about uh, the backups for Azure. So that was like uh, one of the uh, sort of last minute thing added to, to the release. Uh, it was something that was a little bit in the air and we, we didn't know whether this, this was going to happen or not. Um, but we we managed to to add it. Uh, so Marcin, our uh, senior software engineer, um, managed to implement it just like a few days before release. So this is super, super exciting. So basically, first of all, what I want to highlight and then point everybody to is like that we basically cover the three major players, uh, cloud players when it comes to uh, your backup needs. So you can store, uh, configure with it uh, to create backups for AWS, for GCS, and then as of this release uh, for Azure storage. Um, so you could go to our documentation. So it's basically under reference configuration and backups. Uh, and then you can find all the necessary information. And you need, you need to basically know stuff like um, what is your backup uh, Azure container, and potentially you can add uh, the backup as your path. Uh, and then uh, basically recovering the, the necessary um, credentials and the environment of variables. So you definitely need to provide like the, the storage connection string and your storage account. Uh, alternatively, yeah, you could also provide the, the storage key. Um, but from my understanding, I haven't tried it myself yet. Uh, and then given that it landed, uh, yeah, pretty last minute, um, I wasn't able to, to start it just yet, but this is super exciting because that basically means that if you are on Azure and then, and, and then previously you felt like you were missing out because you couldn't set up backups on Azure, well, now you can. Um, and then uh, this is super great and powerful. Uh, so I hope um, people will be excited. Um, so this is cool. And just to wrap up, so if you're curious about this release, uh, go check out our uh, blog post. So basically on, on the blog post, if you go to, to our site, 
Uh, this is the, the first one and we are covering again pretty much the same details. So maybe there's some information that we didn't quite get uh, into maybe in the session, but I believe that we covered most of it. So you can learn about all of this replication, cursor API, backups, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so we cover all of this. Um, and, and a little like a selfish shout, if you are, um, uh, if you if you if you love we eight and you want to follow what we do, uh, you should definitely subscribe to our newsletter, right? Like, uh, subscribe to our newsletter, and I, I also like shared some uh, cool things about the release. Uh, but but also like you know we give shout to like the community. Uh, so this was really really great to see. Uh, this release actually took eighteen different contributors to happen. So this is a pretty big deal. Uh, we had seven, if I can count well. Um, one, two, three, four, seven uh, new contributors. Um, and then it was actually pretty cool to see like Alexander and, and Zenyun uh, to uh, co uh, contribute like from the Go community side, which is absolutely uh, amazing. So if in the future you don't want to also miss out on Weavit Air, definitely su subscribe to the newsletter because we give shouts over there. Uh, and then we also share like interesting blog posts or podcasts. And then in here, for example, you can watch a podcast with um, Etienne and uh, Connor that are talking about it. So if you want to get like the um, the perspective of the CTO on, on, on this, uh, then this could be also a good place to go and learn more about it. Oof, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, <laughs> perfect. So let me just have a one final look uh, on an additional note so we have something from rush so can't wait to get my hands on the new version any details on how a wcs cluster can be upgraded to 118 so <clears throat> it's something that i actually discussed internally um and then at the moment if you're using like the, the free sandboxes we don't offer uh, an automated uh, uh, upgrade. So if you if you do that, like I guess the only way is at the moment is just create a new instance and migrate over your data. Um, maybe something that you could use the cursor API to help you with, because uh, you could like walk through the data to load to read in one side and then create a separate batch export to uh, to do that. Maybe that could be could be a way. But like right now we don't have like a a system to upgrade your instances just yet. Um, and I think um, yeah, if you are a paying customer, then probably Byron might be the best person to to check out. Like, uh, I'm, I'm sure you know who Byron is. If you are a paying customer, um, and then he'll probably be able to help you. Um, but that's at least uh, the story for now. And then Etienne's final words: at least it showed the migration works. I don't know time for re-import re before the demo, but could migrate in time. Hey, this is pretty awesome. <clears throat> So yes, it's definitely quicker to migrate. Um, uh, well, and then re-index your data. Perfect. So unless we get any final questions, any final rockets, I think this will be the, the content that we have for today. What do you think, th team? Anything else from you? No. No? Uh, Zen, Zen is thinking. Stuff. A lot of stuff was covered, lots of improvements. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So in this case, I don't see any final rockets or any final questions. So thank you all very much for watching. This was super exciting. I hope it was as much exciting as it, for you as it was for me and uh, for the team here. Um, and I see like uh, Zen is sending us a, what is it, a chocolate? Okay, it's like a power bar. Oh, you're hungry. Okay, <laughs> let's uh, let's then wrap it up. So thank you for watching. I hope you all are excited. Uh, we are getting some final rockets. So we collected six total rockets. This is a, to the, a record so far. At the end, it's sending us a trophy. Well, a text works as well. Um, <laughs> thank you, Karsten. Thank you all. I hope you enjoy. We did 118. And then please, please uh, send us any additional questions over the community Slack, subscribe to the newsletter, watch our podcast, you know, be with us. And if you have something exciting that you build with VV8 and you would like to join us for an episode maybe next month, hey, uh, second Wednesday of the month, uh, we could be there. So, um, yeah.
So thank you for watching. And uh, bye. Oh, bye. bye. <laughs>